Hello, everybody. I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Joe Marion. I'm the chair of the RFS Neuroservice Line. Um, again, thanks for joining us for our fourth webinar in our series on acute stroke. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that if they have any questions along the way, uh, to type in the question box, which you can see on the, the right side of your screen. Uh, just type a question in there, and then we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, tonight, our presenter is Dr. Sabine Don. Uh, he is an interventional radiologist at PAH uh, Health in Whittier, California. He attended medical school, residency, and fellowship at Northwestern University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, his practice is a mixture of neural and body IR, and he is always learning new things to expand his practice. He also enjoys skiing and tinkering with new technology, and tonight he'll be talking to us about the IR perspective on stroke care and intervention. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Don. Great. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for allowing me to talk on the uh, RFS uh, website. But I'm pretty excited to talk about, you know, kind of my perspective or a body IR perspective for stroke care and um, intervention for that. So um, I first just want to start with saying, you know, I have no disclosures that are, you know, relative to this talk. And I wouldn't be able to really talk much about this or do stroke without some of these guys listed here. You know, Shao and Roger are part of my practice and really, you know, made me kind of do a second year of, of a non-official fellowship in, our, in, in neuro. And I talked to Vinu regularly with uh, different questions on stroke and David and Joseph are super important in the SIR community um, and community to get stroke available and, and, and work on education. So thanks to those guys. And, you know, I know over this is the fourth talk and this is kind of a series of talks about stroke imaging and these are some of the topics that you've talked about already. And from the acute clinical aspect of stroke care to the imaging and the current training pathways. So today, you know, I'm really going to be talking about, you know, what the technique is and what uh, patient selection should be for the procedure. And then, you know, the body IR experience and what the controversy is today. So I'm a body, I'm a, I'm a body vascular trained IR, as, as Joe mentioned at, at Northwestern. And my cerebral experience was zero. I, I, I didn't do really any cerebral angiography or intervention in residency or fellowship. So when I chose to do this job, you know, one of the factors was, you know, I may be doing stroke and they'll teach me how to do it. And, you know, I, I thought that was great. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot of things on the way. And then that's kind of the things I'm going to talk about today and kind of help you know anyone else who, who wants to do something like that or inspire you to, to look at more neuro if you're doing conventional pathway. So I work in the LA area. Uh, my, my hospital's PIH Health. It's in Whittier and Downey. So you can kind of see it's, it's near LA. It's not exactly LA, but um, you know, it's been where it was my first job after fellowship and, and I love it, love it here. So here are the learning objectives we kind of talked about. We're going to start off with patient selection and then go into techniques. So um, a little bit of background. You guys have probably already uh, seen this in the other lectures that acute stroke, it's a big number. I mean, almost a million cases a year in the United States alone. And the overwhelmingly majority of these are ischemic. And so almost 90% are ischemic and, um, you know, stroke, leads to is a leading cause of long-term disability and it can be you know the fifth leading cause of death i mean 140,000 americans each year the ischemic part is important because those are the strokes that we can intervene on from an endovascular perspective and the reason is is these collaterals so you've heard this quote time is brain i mean that's really true and it's really due to not just the circle of Willis, but these peel collaterals that are throughout the brain. And that allows persistent perfusion to the area that's ischemic, just enough to keep that brain alive for a certain period of time. And everyone's collaterals are different. So that's why these time windows have been changing. Now, 
time is brain and you know from about any other procedure that we do maybe trauma included and these are procedures that we're coming in for fast you're thinking fast and you need to treat fast because every single minute i mean you can see in this graph two million brain cells die so uh, really time is of the utmost importance and I have a little timeline here to kind of just review some of these trials. We're not going to go into it, but endovascular therapy for stroke has been around for a while. I mean, since 1995 or more than 20 years ago, people were putting, you know, TPA into the artery to see, to, to disintegrate the clot. And it wasn't really until 2001 when you had the first kind of retrieval device called the Mercy device. Uh, and that really kind of changed the scope, and I'll show you what that device looked like, but it wasn't really until 2009 and 2012 when data was supporting these newer generation or these second and third generation thrombectomy devices. Unfortunately, in 2013 was a kind of a really bad year for stroke, and I think, you know, when, when I started fellowship, I mean, we weren't even thinking about stroke because of these negative trials. And, you know, unfortunately, just their selection criteria didn't really, you know, address these patients who were better served to do, undergo thrombectomy. But you had three trials that came back negative and put a whole, you know, negative face on intervention. So we got a lot better rate, uh, radiology standards and perfusion imaging really helped kind of changed the selection pattern for patients. And so despite the 2013 trials, in 2015, it was a huge change. And in 2015, you had these six trials that showed positive response to endovascular intervention, and that really was due to better patient selection. And, you know, it was really important because all these trials actually came from all around the world. It wasn't just from one center, it was all over, and it was super powerful. Um, to kind of change the scope of, of saying a uh, positive result from stroke thrombectomy. And trials are still going on. You know, as you probably talked in the prior lectures, there's Dawn and Diffuse, and Dawn increased your, you know, time window. So, you know, patient selection really comes down to the team. And, um, you know, this is probably the most important part of the stroke procedure is having a really well-oiled machine between ER, neurology, and whoever's doing the stroke thrombectomy. And you can't really forget about other people who are super important. I mean, the EMTs who are bringing the patients in, they're evaluating, they're bringing them into an appropriate center. You have radiology, and as far as the radiology goes, the diagnostic radiology side has to be pretty well-oiled too. You, you need the patient to get imaging, and everything worked fast. And the ICU takes care of these patients afterwards. So it's a big team and the whole workflow relies on efficiency. So all these kind of terms you hear about door to puncture and, and door to perfusion, all this all relies on a really well-oiled machine and team. And the earlier that someone gets involved in the whole workflow, we find it's better. So, you know, initially when we started the program, uh, we thought maybe we'll get called once everything was set to go and for a patient who was a candidate. But we found out pretty early on that if we get involved earlier, we can shave off a lot of time. Now, there's this huge document that came out this year. It's 255 pages. I'll admit I haven't read the whole thing, but it is the 2018 guidelines that the AHA and ASA sent out. And um, I'm going to basically delve down into the important parts and summarize them for you because this is really the patient selection part of these procedures. And so what patients should be included? Now, this is important. It's, it's a guideline. It's not a rule. So all of these, you know, aspects of the paper, you don't have to follow them to the T. And, and that's where it comes down to having a clinical knowledge of what you can do and the effect of it. So, um, you know, a lot of these decisions, we talk with the neurologist and, and figure out what, you know, is the potential gain for doing a thrombectomy if they're not following under these guidelines. 
So, you know, age of greater than 18, we haven't at my institution treated anyone under 18, but I know of some people who have and have had great results. The pre-MRS score, and I'll show you a table of what MRS is if you haven't read about it yet, but it's the modified ranking scale. And really you want to make sure that this patient that you're going to be treating, that their baseline, they're, they're doing pretty well because you can't make someone better than their baseline. So, you know, I've been called about some cases, you know, a nursing home patient who already was, you know, very, you know, unfortunately had a lot of morbidities and, and didn't really have a functional status and they're calling for a stroke thrombectomy and you're really not going to make that patient any better. Um, this NIHS is a stroke scale and this, in these studies, you know, use six or greater. And a larger number is basically a, a, lar a more, you know, drastic stroke. And so I've treated patients that are under six. And, and again, it has to deal with the clinical situation. A lot of times some patients, especially in a posterior stroke, can have waxing and waning symptoms. The aspect score, which you guys have probably gone over in the, in the stroke imaging talk, really has to deal with it's, it's another way of, of looking at how bad the core infarct is. If there's a lot of loss of gray white on the CT, then the stroke is probably completed. But, you know, we use this kind of rule of sixes, so stroke scale of six, aspect score of six. A lot of times in the beginning, they use the, the time window of six hours or less. But like we said, because of dawn, now even these guidelines have distributed between less than six hours or greater than six hours. Defining a large vessel occlusion is also, I, I guess you can call it controversial. Now these papers really looked into ICA and M1 clot, but you know there are studies that show benefits to M2, M3, ACA, and of course posterior strokes in the basilar. And you know I've gone and, and treated all you know clots in all these locations. And, and you might not have guide, these are guidelines that don't go to M3 or whatnot, but again, having a good mentor or having a way to learn it and know with the neurologist, what is the best way or what's the outcome that you can obtain. And per the guidelines, perfusion imaging is, is not really required under six hours, but at my institution, we pretty much do perfusion on anyone. I mean, even if they show up at one hour from onset. It gives you a lot of information and as long as your radiology workflow is, is well oiled, it really doesn't add much time. Now, these are some things to, to keep in mind. You know, blood glucose, uh, really, you know, these patients who are uh, coming in with a low glucose can mimic a stroke. And I even had a stroke call once where we were going down the whole stroke pathway, getting a CTA and CTP, and the blood glucose came back as 20. So you have to make sure that you know you exclude some of these patients or find out a, a mimicker. Now you can have patients that have a rapidly improving stroke scale, um, and that might be because of a TPA drift and the clot is disintegrating. So you know the, those patients you might decide not to do thrombectomy. Um, but you have to watch out for someone who's waxing and waning. Blood pressure, you want to control. You don't want to drop it too low because it increases your perfusion to the brain. And generally, the number we use is 185 or 110 for a diastolic. Um, these other numbers, INR3, you know, they really shouldn't be having a clot if their INR is that high, but there's, there's other reasons. They could be super therapeutic, and that's really a a contraindication to IVTPA, not really thrombectomy, but you have to be careful. And the imaging really, you know, it comes down again. The imaging will tell us, is this an ischemic stroke? Is there a mimicker? Is there something else? Or is there no embolus? So the imaging is a pivotal role. And, you know, the non-contrast CT, all of these level one strokes that we get are getting a non-contrast CT. And that's going to tell you, again, the biggest question, is it hemorrhagic or ischemic, and how much of the brain is in, affected from the aspect score. From there, we're already involved at that point and making a decision with neurology and ER to do a triple scan on the table.
And a triple scan re relates to, you know, one part is the non-con, and then the other two is a CTA head and neck, and then perfusion. And for centers who don't have CT perfusion, you can do a modified kind of MR perfusion, or you could do a diffusion weighted sequence and, and things like that. Of course, the CT is gonna be your quickest. Um, but per the guidelines, you can do any type of quote unquote perfusion scanning. So, you know, you gotta see that there's a penumbra and really your cerebral blood volume is gonna tell you how much blood in a total quantity is coming to that area and how much of those collaterals are actually keeping that brain alive. And like I said, we'll talk, you know, I just wanted to introduce you guys to the scales that we'll be talking about, MRS, stroke scale and aspects. And, you know, don't get bogged down with all the numbers. You just know that the higher the number can be worse or in, in the setting of aspects, higher the number, the better. Your, your typical great one would be in aspects 10, the large stroke scale and an MRS of zero. So <clears throat> our pre-MRS of zero. So when, whenever I get a call about a stroke, I think of these questions in my head and I'm trying, they're either gonna tell me the history of this or I'll actually ask them the question. And you wanna know what the symptoms are. Are they correlating with the imaging? What's the stroke scale? You know, when did the symptoms start? You really want to try to get what's the last known well. This was very important in the beginning when, when stroke trials were supporting six hours or less. But now, you know, you can go up to 24 hours and a lot of these are wake-up strokes. You know, what is the patient at baseline? The pre-MRS is, is really important. And sometimes the ER is not thinking about that. You know, they're, they're already going down, you know, stroke thrombectomy. But again, the patient has to be pretty functional at baseline. Cardiac history, it, it can or it doesn't really affect what, what I'm going to do. Um, it's just nice to know. And it's nice to know if the patient got TPA or not. You know, if a patient got TPA, it doesn't mean I'm not going to do thrombectomy. It won't even really modify my technique except some things that I would do in the procedure or after. Um, and if you know if the patient has a prior stroke, they'll kind of help you understand some of the imaging. You can get a lot of artifacts on the perfusion due to that. So you just want to know all of that info. And then most importantly, after you look at the images, and this is where, you know, you got to have a clinical mind and, and understand stroke in the clinical setting. So you want to know, you know, if you save that part of the brain, that penumbra, because a lot of times there's already, you know, somewhat of a small core infarct. You want to know, is that going to benefit the patient? And, you know, you don't really learn that in a conventional radiology residency or fellowship. So I had to learn a lot of that through asking questions or whatnot. But if you, you know, get the chance to follow a neurologist or, or learn about it, you can learn a lot. So that was kind of the dry stuff about, you know, what the patient selection and, and everything. But now I'll kind of go into the cool part of the technique. And so, you know, the patient gets on the table now, we perform our stroke thrombectomy with conscious sedation. There are people who do it with general anesthesia, and we haven't gone that route. So you just have to know that when they get induced, or even when you do the conscious sedation, you don't want the blood pressure to go below 140 at a systolic. So with our conscious sedation, these patients are confused, they're moving, you want to restrain their extremities, including their head, we we'll tape the head to the board. Um, now, again, time is of the essence. And, and if your techs are prepping the table, I'll come in and scrub and help them. And, you know, I'll make sure all the devices are nearby, pretty much ready to go. It took me a while to familiarize myself with the device sizes and lengths because in the neurospace, everything's a little bit different. You have to know what fits through what and make sure all your lengths are compatible. And the other thing I do, and why I always like getting a CTA beforehand is to look at the neck imaging because that's going to determine the arch anatomy and what tortuosity and any calcium you're going to deal with, which are huge parts from a technique perspective. So the first step, I, I kind of divided the technique into two parts. And coming from my background where I didn't have a lot of above the neck uh, intervention, the first step is to get stable access into the neck. And, you know, we primarily go through the groin 
Um, you can go radial or even a direct prodded stick for select cases. But I'm going to just focus on the groin uh, for today's talk. And, you know, I always use ultrasound. I think there's no reason not to. And I'll put in eight or nine French sheath in the groin. And then, you know, something that we don't really use in the peripheral space is something called a balloon guide sheath or balloon guide catheter. And then you use these different selective catheters in a coaxial system. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by coaxial, but everything you want to do is save time. So by looking at the CTA beforehand, I kind of already know what catheter I'm going to use, what wire, and what system. The arch anatomy, you know, if you're not familiar with it, it doesn't look that bad when you look at a type 2 or type 3 arch, but the angles and the size of the aortic arch can make catheterizing, you know, a right common carotid artery very difficult. Or in the same way, when you have a two vessel arch, getting into that left common carotid artery can be pretty tough. Um, uh, so, you know, these are things that I had to kind of learn. And, and, you know, if I were to do it again, I would have loved to scrub into more cases before, you know, learning it on the job. Now, the coaxial technique, and I'm hoping these videos show up pretty nicely, is basically, you know, the other term is called front-loading telescopic technique. And so we use the selective catheter to get the wire into the artery. And then through that whole system, I coaxially, you know, advance my catheter and then my guide sheath. And you can see in this, the guide sheath has two radiopic markers, which show the area of the balloon. This is a flow gate. And so this saves time. Now you can do another technique where you put an exchange length wire and then you can take out your system and do that. And that works too, but we find that that takes some time. So again, if you use this kind of front loading telescopic technique, that'll save you even a minute or a minute and a half, which is anything helps. One of the other things that was new to me was forming reverse curve catheters in the arch. Now in fellowship, I, I typically use the cope technique, which is a suture technique when we formed reverse curve catheters in the abdomen. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't really familiar with forming a SIMS two or SIMS three in the arch. So that's another thing that you can learn. Um, you know, there are other catheters you can use like a VTK um, that, that Venu kind of introduced me into, but um, learning those type of catheters are important in forming those catheters. So after you conquer the neck and getting stable access into the artery of choice, the second step is going to be the brain. And, you know, I do an angiogram to see, you know, I already know where the clot is, at least at the time of the CTA. Now we're going to see, has there been anything different? Let's define, you know, the sizes of the vessels. But the first thing is, you know, before even going there, you got to know your anatomy. And I was not familiar with too much anatomy, cerebral anatomy, except basic. And one of, one of the parts that are unique to neurovascular space is dealing with AP and laterals. And I know I mixed two patients here, but I put these images here to kind of show you that the, there's a lot of overlap. So you in your brain, and it was something that took me a year to really kind of learn, is to separate your MCA and your ACA. And because when you're looking in a lateral plane, you can almost get confused. So, um, you know, it's something that you don't deal with in the peripheral space, but in the brain, you have a lot of overlapping vasculature. And to really know where you're gonna be putting your wires and, and where the clots are, you have to separate this. So now I mentally do this when I'm looking on a lateral space. And I thought these images kind of show the ACA versus MCA. Now, what is a balloon guide catheter? Again, this is new in the in the neurospace um, and that we that wouldn't be familiar to peripheral uh, body guys is is basically this balloon at the end of the catheter. And a lot of studies are supporting, or no, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are studies that support using a balloon guide catheter for flow reversal or flow arrest. And the idea is that you can minimize distal embolization or what that means is if you're pulling the clot, the clot embolizes into a more distal territory. Now these catheters naturally are a little bit bigger 
are stiffer. There's a lot of them, you know, there's really three of them on the market, the Cello, Flowgate, and the Mercy. But really, we use the Flowgate, and, and it's a pretty good device. And I'll say I, I, my balloon guide catheter is a first choice for me if the anatomy allows. And you can see that's the balloon going up. Now, non-balloon guide catheters, most people use a Neuron Max, which is a great uh, guiding catheter and um, our guiding sheath. And then there's shuttle and destination. And they're in six to eight French sizes. Now, for anyone that's going to be doing thrombectomy, this is a really great article. And I was introduced to this article at the SIR stroke course this year. And it actually is just, it puts a lot of the physics of a clot retrieval into your mind. And, you know, we can just be operators and do it, but actually to understand what's going on and the forces make you understand the process a lot better. So we won't go, I, I put these three figures from this article to kind of show you, you know, what it goes into and, and to show you that the vessels aren't straight. You know, there's a lot of forces, a lot of vectors, and that's why there are so many devices and things we use to get up there to get the clot. And the last picture on the bottom tries to show you, you know, when you pull in the clot, you know, something can get sheared off or cause a distal embolization. So, so it's an article I recommend everyone to read, and it's, it's pretty well written. So just to familiarize with another device that, again, uh, we don't really use in the peripheral space is a distal access catheter or DAC. And there's so many of them on the market, um, but these are some of them. You got a CAT6, you got A68, and basically from the balloon guide sheath, you have this other catheter that goes closer to the clot. You can think about it like that. Adds more support, but most importantly, it applies suction closer to the clot. And like that other slide showed, and if you read that article, if you can apply suction to the proximal face of the clot, your chances of retrieving it are better. And, you know, this is that first device in 2001, a UCLA neuro, um, neuro radiologist invented what's called the Mercy Retriever. And so it's kind of neat. You can get it in this picture, in this video that I'm showing, but it's kind of, you know, this little corkscrew device that you hope, you know, catches the clot and you can pull it down all the way into your guide catheter. Now, this is an ideal situation they changed the device. The picture on the right is a Mercy 2 when they actually added some fibrin or some, some little tiny fibers. But really what would happen with this, this, this retrieval device would most of the time just unravel and the clot would stay in place. So it was great. They had some decent results, but it didn't really change the scope of things. Then came, you know, the second generation and third generation devices. And this is where we get into you know, aspirating the clot directly into the catheter, the ADAPT te technique. And then you have these classic techniques where, you know, you can pull the clot using a stent retriever into a guide catheter. And, you know, I, I imaged some stent retrievers here for you. The main ones we use are the Solitaire and Trevo. There's a new one called the 3D Capture. But here is the image of them. Basically, it's a stent that's welded onto a wire. So it it does not, you know, disconnect. I haven't seen it happen. I believe earlier generations it did uh, accidentally, but the these new ones that are out don't disconnect. So you literally pull the stent out of the brain externally and, and you allow it to dwell in the clot. Now, mostly everyone allows the stent to be up for about five minutes. That lets you integrate into the clot. So you can actually pull the clot and I'm going to show you some cases and some images using these, but these are the two ones I would say are, are the most commonly used stent retrievers. And if you look at how many techniques are available, and I mean, I have eight of them here, four and five are basically the same thing, but I wouldn't get bogged down on this. You know, there are different techniques, but they're all variations of a similar concept where you put a stent retriever up, and you allow aspiration and you try to do some sort of flow control or reversal. Now, the ADAPT technique, the last one listed there, that's a little bit different. That's just aspirating the clot. And the trap and arts is what I really use now for pretty much all of my retrievals. And what it is, is you basically cork the clot between the distal axis catheter and the stent retriever and pull it all out as a unit. Um, Based on the last 
course at SIR, the stroke course, I feel that most um, people who are doing stroke thrombectomy are leaning towards the trap and arts technique, but it's not saying that any of these other techniques are wrong. And, and again, they have all these interesting names and then the names are related to the actual company. So I wouldn't get worried about this. Now, the other kind of technique you need to know our kind of alternate knowledge is again out of the, the neurospace is carotid stenting. Some of these patients need a carotid stent. Embolization protection devices, intracranial angioplasty and stenting, and medical management. Now, of course, I'm not saying that I do these on every case, but I've had to utilize that. And, you know, it, it's something that I luckily was, was able to learn based on the guys in my practice. The medical management gets really difficult um, for kind of rare cases where you're stenting or putting in a carotid stent. So being familiar with different, you know, alternative platelet inhibitors and things like that are important. And uh, I was actually just on a phone call today with Vino about what he does for some of his intracranial stenting. So here's a case, time to kind of wrap everything in to what we just discussed about. Now, you know, we had a 64-year-old guy who's last known well. Again, this is the last time that he was seen normal. And it was 12 hours ago, basically, before he went to bed. And he came, you know, woke up, his family found him, and he had a dense hemiparesis of his left side, he had aphasia, he had right-sided gaze and neglect. So <clears throat> basically, you know, he has a large stroke and the ER and radiology were great about getting perfusion imaging that showed a large vessel M1 occlusion and a large area of penumbra. There was core involving the basal ganglia, which I'm not showing right now. But we decided to take them and, you know, now I've passed the neck anatomy I have a balloon guide in the in the internal carotid and I'm doing my run. So the first step is to get across the clot. I like to use roadmap to do that and a really tight J on my wire. I tried to include a video of that, but unfortunately I couldn't get a good video of that particular part. But once you cross the clot and you advance your microcatheter across the clot, then you can, you can push the stent retriever through the microcatheter. And you can see in that, in that video, I'll play it again. You're actually pushing that stent retriever with markers into the catheter, and then you unsheath it. So when you unsheath it, um, you can, it basically is like a self-expanding stent, and you let that unsheath and sit there for five minutes. And like I said before, then you literally pull, and this is the Salumbra technique. So this is an old technique that I used to do. And you know now I would actually remove this whole thing as a unit in the traps or arts technique. But this is pulling the stent retriever into the intermediate catheter, distal access catheter. And um, I, I had a little, little labels here so you can kind of see what each part is. And you can see that on the bottom, that's the flow gate and the balloon guide. So in this case, you know that's what we had prior. And literally just with one pass, the brain um, shows perfusion and the clot's gone. You're really looking on both. I just included the AP view here, but you're looking at both AP and lateral for any distal embolization. But we were pretty happy with this. We'll go over Tiki scoring, but this would be a Tiki 2C. Um, Tiki 3 is what the ideal is, but there's a little flow that's a little bit slower, so it would be a Tiki 2C. And this was his brain that was at risk um, with the whole right MCA territory. And there was core infarct in the basal ganglia, but on a post one day MRI, you can see that, you know, his whole area was fine. And he actually, his MRS went back to baseline to about one, um, you know, pretty dramatically quickly. And then he was down to zero by three months. So it's a pretty remarkable um, part of, of stroke thrombectomy to always see this. And so here is a here is an example of an ADAPT technique. And this is one you just try to suck the clot out. So some people try to do this first. And this is just an example of a fluoros save that I had of one that we did. And, and really it's basically the same thing where you get the microcatheter across the clot 
But then instead of deploying a stent, you can kind of see here, this is the, the, the distal aspiration or axis catheter then rides up the microcatheter. You can get stuck at the ophthalmic artery a lot of times. This one shows that we were able to get all the way to the clot. And so, you know, this is, this is also great, especially for clots that are a little bit smaller and you can just suck the whole clot in and that's what happened here. Um, again, I pretty much still do the trap or arts technique as my primary, but the ADAP technique as shown here can be pretty useful. So Tiki scoring, again, a higher score is what we want. We want Tiki 3 for all our patients. And that just means you have, you know, reestablished complete good blood flow to the brain. Um, I didn't include TK2C here, but a lot of times we get TK2B, and that still is pretty acceptable, um, especially if that more than half of that territory that you're perfusing is the eloquent cortex of the brain or the brain that you want to save. If you get a small embolus to, say, the frontal lobe, then that might not really matter so much than something in the parietal or temporal. And, you know, I, I put a little perspective because now, you know, talked about technique to kind of talk about why is stroke so important. So just to give you a little perspective, I got these numbers from this website called the NNT or the number needed to treat.com. And if you look at lung cancer screening, that is 217 patients. So for, you know, you get this, we have a screening program at our hospital. It's great. We've identified some stage one lung cancers. Now, mammography is 84 patients. As you might see where I'm going with this. PCI is 50 patients. Uh, and so defibbing in the setting of, of, of you know, cardiac arrest is three. And believe it or not, stroke is down to two. So that's how this can be so important. Now, I know I'm kind of not comparing apples to apples here, where, where some of them are mortality and morbidity differences. I end up asking the NNT for two is making a significant change to the MRS score, but it's quite remarkable and very powerful data. And that's why I think all of us as IR should get involved. These are all clots that we took out at um, my hospital. And that one in the center is the clot that, you know, from the case that I just showed you. So yes, time is brain. And this is how the clots come off, if, if you can see it on the stent retriever. Now, you know, defining the need. Now, now I'm kind of going into the controversy of um, IR. I'm going to have to restart my PowerPoint here. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so let me just start it up again real quick. I thought it might have too many animations. So let me go here. So defining the need, basically, you know, Dr. Sachs has done a lot about who should be treating stroke and from the SIR committee. And you can see a bunch of these articles and these articles, I'm just kind of flashing about what is coming out today. And you can see a lot from SNIS, which is a society of neurointerventional uh, surgeries, is there's a lot of controversy of body IRs doing stroke. Now, Dr. David Sachs, he did a really great presentation at the stroke course this year, really defining the need, going into the numbers of, of why more people need to be doing stroke. Now, we talked about 90% of strokes are ischemic and about 10% of those are eligible for thrombectomy. That's just an average. And that's based on, you know, last known well of six hours or less. So now with 24 hours, it's even more. But let's just go with the 10%. That comes out to 75,000 cases per year in the US alone. And then you deal with these, you know, what comprehensive stroke centers, which we are at PIH Health, and then versus non centers. Say, you know, there's other ones, primary stroke, a thrombectomy capable, but you're dealing with this issue of transferring patients. And you're, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, this whole drip and ship thing means. Do you, you start the TPA drip and then transfer the patient? You can get a lot of time, you know, delay here. And we see it in our practice where a patient that gets transferred from a non-stroke center, it can be even more than two hours. So you're losing all that time. You know, 
what is it better just to go directly to the comprehensive stroke center it definitely i think that's the best but you know then the argument is if you have more centers is that dilute the experience and then decrease your volume so you know stroke is getting so much heat it's even in the wall street journal in february they had an article about how there's this great therapy you know thrombectomy but people aren't getting it because it's not available so again we need operators that are good at doing this now here are slides directly from david's talk and if you really delve into the numbers and what joint commission is even suggesting mainly because of snis you can't even maintain that type of number system. I mean, your SNIS committee is 900 members short if you actually go with some of these numbers. So obviously, you know, there's this big devoid and, and a big controversy going on right now. And, you know, neurology has created an interventional neurology tract and they use these arguments. And these all, all of these arguments can apply to body IR. But of course, since it's not supported by SINS, that's a whole different issue. But you can see by these, these quotes here that there's obviously a need for operators to do this. And you know, it's it's funny that that an interventional neurologist who doesn't have much catheter-based skills outside of that can can get an easier track into this. So you know, <clears throat> interventional radiology, this, this article came out in JAMA just this year, early on in this year. It's a little bit kind of confusing and the data is old, but it does show, at least at that time, before the 2015 landmark trials, that IR was responsible for about 40%. If you use other estimates, there's nothing that shows exactly what IR is doing. And, and from non-neuro trained IR, it can be as low as 15%. You'll see other societies talk about stroke intervention. I pulled up this article. I won't talk much more about it than the fact that it's under peripheral vascular disease. And I really don't think you can treat the brain like a leg or a coronary artery. It's very different. And that's why it's very important to learn the proper techniques. So I understand why other societies say that you need formal training, but I believe formal training can be in different, you know, aspects so you can see on social media that some cardiologists feel that since they do STEMI pretty quickly that it can relate to stroke but I don't really think that that's uh, appropriate so um, these are articles that I found and there's more coming out about body IRs our vascular interventional radiologists who are doing stroke and showing that it's possible and doable now there's no you know official paper with data in the US, but that's being worked on right now actually by um, Dr. Sachs at all uh, about tabulating data to show that it's equivalent to these trials. Now on the SIR open forum, there's a really interesting read, and I recommend you guys to all look through this thread. It's like over 40 replies, and you can see the different, you know opinions and 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 see kind of the the reasoning of what to do now the stroke training guidelines are uh, are outdated they're from 2009 but we i'm actually on this committee to redo them in, for 2019 so we meet on the phone monthly and we're working on this to kind of go for the guidelines for vascular body to do strokes so those are being worked on and sir is doing a lot to get this going. So the bottom line, can body IR do thrombectomy? I definitely think so. Obviously, that's what happened with me. And I think there are caveats. And you know, I totally understand the controversy and why some you know people feel that we can't. And that's where it comes down to having a mentor, having, you know, really learning it, almost being handheld, you know, at least for me, to do thrombectomy. And then, you know, you guys are lucky where, you know, you're in a training program and you can, you know, it might have to be extra work, but you can go and scrub into more cases. And, you know, stroke is emergent. You can't really predict it. But just learning, you know, even in other cases, carotid stenting, aneurysm, coiling, you'll learn a lot of techniques that are way different than the peripheral space. And you'll also see 
you know, the brain is a different, you know, beast and it doesn't handle bleeds well. I've caused, you know, one or two bleeds and it's, it's a terrible feeling because, you know, they can be drastic and, you know, pretty much be fatal because the brain does not like bleeds. So you have to respect it. And I definitely think a body IR can do thrombectomy. It's just, you need to, you know, you can't just watch this lecture or read about it and do it, but actually be, you know, trained to do it. So I'll, I'll end with this, this case. Now, uh, just to kind of, again, kind of inspire anyone who wants to do this, but you can see on the CT that there's a hyperdense basilar sign. So it's, it's a hyperdense clot into the basilar artery and the left vertebral artery. And this is a young guy. He's obviously sick because he's getting a uh, total knee arthroplasty. But, you know, on post-op day two, he is found, he just loses consciousness. He's inpatient. So this goes quick. Um, he comes down, gets a triple scan, and you can see that on the scan, the cerebellum is, is at risk. And not really the cerebellum, but the brainstem. So uh, the brainstem is your living lifeline on the brain. And so without that, you know, that's, that can be drastic and fatal. So just showing you a little angio. Now the posterior circulation, again, data there is still being developed, but I think everyone who does thrombectomy feels comfortable doing a posterior stroke. It doesn't really matter about the birth because you have two, but once the clot is in the basilar, that can knock out a lot of little tiny perforators and everything um, that, you know, supply the brainstem and the thalami. So, you know, this is a little example of the trap technique. So once you're in the posterior cerebral artery that's shown in that AP view, you're able to remove everything out as a unit. You can see that that is being removed as a unit into the catheter. And normally the, the aspiration catheter is a little bit closer to the stent, but this clot actually was really big. So this is the clot that was pulled out. You can almost see the valves from the femoral vein that this probably came from. Um, and, you know, he actually did pretty remarkable. So there's your, your uh, post thrombectomy view. And again, his cerebellum that had a small infarct and his brainstem was totally fine. So these cases are really fun, exciting. You know, obviously they don't always go as well, but the majority of the time they do. And I find myself really lucky to be a part of this process. Now, just kind of, I get these questions a lot from people who don't do stroke. You know, where should you start? I think going to a course uh, is, is great. And SIR has a great course that they began three years ago. This year's was the best of yet. And um, I think it's just going to get better. And they might even have an independent course coming out in the near future. So um, being a trainee, you know, whether you're a med student, resident, or fellow, I really just recommend getting experience. Just go into the suite, you know, see a couple strokes that you'll be way ahead of where I was when I started uh, my job. And, you know, you'll, 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 you'll be surprised how much you learn from every single case. And still to this day, you know, I'm learning things every single day. And, you know, it's funny, I always get this question from, from some of my friends who do it. And they're like, what about call? Like, how can you deal with that? And, you know, once, once you start thinking about that, then, then sometimes I think that maybe stroke isn't for you. I mean, you do have to be dedicated to this. And, and, and it doesn't matter what time of day. Most of the time, luckily... You know, you're not getting strokes in the middle of the night. Uh, you can, but they're usually sleeping. But at the same time, you know, you can't really be worrying about call. So I really, you know, I've, I've learned a lot on Twitter. Uh, that's, that's sort of a place where I've, you know, talked about stroke and, and interact. So you can learn a lot. And these are some of the guys I would follow um, on there to learn a lot about neurovascular imaging the, the Journal of Neuro, uh, the JNIS is great and, and does a lot of great articles to learn too. But I didn't really talk about the radial approach, but the neuroradialist neuro is great. And you can do a lot of these cases from the wrist. And I've actually had to do that, especially for posterior circulation. So, um, you know, just something, something else to learn. But that's kind of my talk. And I appreciate, again, the RFS and SIR letting me talk to you guys and share my experience. I'm hoping that, you know, this inspires some people to do it and learn because we need to do stroke. 
there are so many patients out there that aren't getting treated and um, I'm always available for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Don. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, first one here is, uh, what is SIR doing to get the Joint Commission to change their wording regarding training of the stroke interventionalist? It basically excludes people by the IRP. Yeah, so, you know, one of the big things is this, uh, this paper that we're working on in order to show, you know, the actual data of combined groups with body and body and, and neural IR to show that the data supports it. Now, there's a joint commission and then there's this other thing, other committee called DNB. And, you know, not officially speaking, it seems the DNB will hold the position separate from joint commission to allow body IRs to do strokes. So that's in, in regards to getting certified. Um, you know, again, it's a big, I don't know what the joint commission stance is going to be in three years, but, you know, they have shown that in a, in a thrombectomy capable center, TCC, that they have gone along with SNIS guidelines right now and are requiring a, a neuro uh, fellowship. And if you have a chance, you know, I would do it. You would, you would never have a problem. I know I don't, I don't really know how the neuro fellowships will work after IRDR, but, um, you know, I do think with the, with the data that will come out and, you know, there's going to be a lot of talks and everything to hopefully switch JCO's uh, joint, joint commission's ideas. All right, great. Uh, second question here is how many cases do you think would be sufficient to do before one is comfortable doing independent stroke intervention without formal NIR training? Yes, that's actually a great, great question. I was supposed to talk about that. So for me, you know, I, um, per our credentialing process, the, the numbers were low, but for me, my own personal experience, it took me about 25 cases of being, you know, stroke cases to kind of be familiar with the equipment and the anatomy. And that doesn't include, you know, the 50 or so cerebral angiograms diagnostic that I did too, to help familiarize myself with the neck anatomy and be comfortable with it. So, you know, I would say, you know, 25 for me was a number when I started feeling a little bit more comfortable because, you know, just, just learning the devices, but just, you know, you need a little bit more cases to be familiarized with the neck. And so, you know, I would say those would be kind of my target numbers. Uh, and and uh, with the guidelines that we're revising, we haven't decided the numbers yet, but we are working on those too. All right. Uh, we do have one more question here. Uh, before we get to that one, I'd like to remind people that if you do have any other questions, uh, go ahead and type those in the, the question box in the right-hand part of the screen. Uh, last question that we have here um, is, are there any particular devices that are used for distal thrombectomy, for example, in the distal M2? Hmm. So, you know, the vessels start getting really small once you go to distal M2 and M3. And most of the time, you know, if the vessels are, if, if the patient's vessels are a little bit big, you could get away with doing, you know, like an ADAPT out there because there's a three max catheter. Um, or a three, a three max that you can go there and suck out the clot. A lot of times we will inject intraarterial uh, TPA directly into the branch that's affected and hope that that will break the clot up. It has on several occasions and several occasions it has not worked for me. Um, but definitely putting a stent retriever kind of in the distal in M3 or M4 is 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 scary and and probably you know usually not recommended um and definitely off label so you know as far as devices techniques i would say the most common would be injecting some tpa you know if we threw the clot or are proximal to that clot and hope that it breaks it up but there are more devices coming out and again there's a lot of a lot of hot topics and stroke so and companies are trying to get all over it so in the next couple of years, there might be some some really neat device available. Awesome. Well, Dr. Don, it looks like, uh, oh, we do have one more question here. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. So the question is, uh, when should we expect the number of procedure requirements statement by SIR? It's planned for 2019. Um, mm -hmm. that, our, our goal is to release that guidelines document probably, you know, I don't know what quarter of 2019 that Dr. David Sachs would know more about that. Uh, but we're working on it. We're, we're, we're having uh, monthly conferences and everything to get that paper done as soon as possible. So sometime in 2019. Okay. All right, well, uh, to respect everybody's time here, we are coming to the end of the hour. And uh, on behalf of uh, RFS, I'd like to thank Dr. Don for your time in putting this presentation together and uh, presenting to us. Uh, recording of this will be available on, uh, on YouTube uh, in the near future. Uh, uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for letting me, uh, for inviting me on this. Thanks a lot.